right, good morning. Come on, you excited to be here worshiping with your church family this morning? Come on, you excited? Make some noise. Man, it's so good to be with you guys. I love worshiping with our church family. I love it so much and so super, super excited. I also want to welcome everybody on our Ashland campus and watching online as well. And I'm sure your host just told you, as Pastor Adam just said here, next Sunday is one of the best Sundays. In fact, the second greatest Sunday of the year to invite someone to church. As you heard this, it's one of your coworkers, your family, your friends that will come with you. I went back and looked, and the last time we had Christmas Eve on a Sunday was 2017. And in 2017, it was our first year into our new facility here at Moorhead. And that Christmas Eve, of course, we were at that time, one church, multiple you know, counties driving to this one location. But at that time, we had almost just a few people shy of having 2,000 people here on that Christmas weekend. It was unbelievable. And so what I'm trying to tell you is a lot of people who won't come to church maybe through the week, and I know because of the pandemic and everything, people have scattered and done their things, but next Sunday is a great opportunity for your spouse or your kid or your uncle or your brother or that family member or even that co-worker that you want to jack slap sometime. You know what I'm talking about. Anybody have some of those, right? Like even that person, like, like come on, they are willing to come. As Pastor Adam said, if you would just invite them. And so I would encourage you to do that, invite them, pray for them. I would also say you probably want to get here early and you want to get you a good seat. You want to be scooted in because we're going to need every single seat in the house next week at both of our locations because we're expecting God to do some great things. So I encourage you, make sure that you invite people. All right, grab your Bibles, go to Matthew chapter two in this series called The Gift. And the Lord's really been using it in my life, speaking to me. I've been so thankful to study through the text and just uh, research this, and some of you know this, that last year we called off our Christmas service due to snow. And so this year we look like we're pretty good, doesn't look like it's coming, so it's, that's awesome. Now I'm all for a white Christmas, so I hope right after the services it dumps like 12 inches, okay? That's what I'm praying for, like it could be a miracle, Christmas miracle, I love white Christmas, but I'd rather than have no snow and worship with our church family than have a, a white Christmas. So it looks like we're gonna be on track there, but we canceled it and we did the nativity scene, right? We did the cast of Christmas, we talked about Mary and Joseph, obviously, and baby Jesus, we talked about the shepherds, but we didn't get to the wise men. So we dedicated this entire series to talk about the wise men. Who are they? Where are they from? How did they find the star? What was the star? How did they get to that point? We'll talk a little bit more about that next week. But we've been looking at the gifts that they brought to Jesus when he was born. Now, we know, and we talked about this, and I'll point that out to you just in a moment, that the wise men were not there the exact night that Jesus was born. Somewhere after he was dedicated at the temple until he was two years old, somewhere in that range did the wise men show up. And so, just with that in our mind, as we study through the text, we'll, we'll look at the gifts that, that they brought to Jesus, study them, and then maybe hopefully the Lord will use it to speak at your life as he has in mine. And so as we jump into Matthew chapter two, verse one, we've done this every, every, every Sunday leading up to this, as this is the foundational passage for us. So if you're ready to get started, come on, so let's go. You gotta wake up, here we go. All right, verse one. It says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea during the reign of King Herod. And King Herod was a wicked, wicked king. Don't need to give him any props any of the Christmas, but he's a wicked king. About that time, some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, now watch this, they go to the king and listen to what they ask the king. Where is the newborn king of the Jews? Herod's like, you're looking at him. I'm the king of the Jews. No, where's the newborn king? We saw his star rose and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this and so was everyone in Jerusalem. Well, you would be too if you were the king when someone comes looking for a new king. Verse four, he called a meeting of the leading priest and the teachers of the religious law and says, where's the Messiah supposed to be born? So even the wicked pagan King Herod knew that someday a Messiah was to be born. And verse five, it says, in Bethlehem of Judea, everybody knows that, man. Everybody talks about that. Everybody knows if you know your Old Testament, you know this. For this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the ruling cities. For a ruler will come out of you who will be the shepherd for my people, Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting. So he kicked everybody out, just brought in the wise men, just them, you know, just them. And he says, listen, we have learned from the time the star appeared. I wanna know about this. When did you see it? When did it happen? What month was it? How long ago was it? He's tracking to see when the baby could have been born and how old the baby might be. And then he said in verse eight, then he told them, you go to Bethlehem. 
Search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. That is not what he wanted to do. He wanted to kill Jesus. But after this, the interview of the wise men, they went on their way, and the star had led them to east, guided them to Bethlehem, and he went ahead of them, and he stopped over the place where the child was. So now he's in the house, wherever he's at, they're there. And when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house, and they saw the child with his mother married, and they bowed down and worshiped him. This is very important, not them. Worshiped him as the parent, as, as, as Jesus. And then they opened up their treasure chest, and here's what we've been focused on, right? They gave him the gift of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And that's what we've been for the last couple of weeks, and so if you missed it, you can go back and watch online. We encourage you to do that. But they brought these three gifts, and I don't know, I don't know in the mind of the wise men, did they know what they truly represented? I know they know that he was to be a king and what gift do you bring a king is gold. I doubt anybody here at their baby shower got gold, a gold bar, right, as your baby shower. I, I don't know about that. Now, I saw that Costco sold $100 million worth of bar of gold. Y'all see that? That's crazy. It got discounts. So one ounce bar of gold, they sold $100 million. It's one of my favorite stores now, by the way. Uh, I love Costco, my family. We're starting to fall in love with it. We're late bloomers, but we are, we're catching on to that as well. Still can't find my way around it, so pray for me when I am there. But hey, we'll, 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 make, it, uh, we'll make it through it. So you got these bar of golds because he's a king. If you remember it, that Sunday, I said, it's Jesus, the king of your life. They knew that he was a king, but he's the king of your life. Is he the king of how you run your family? Because if you peel back the layer of your heart, who would be sitting on the throne of your life? For the most of us, it would be a picture of us. Because we want to be the leader, the boss, the ruler, the king, the Lord of our life. We want to do what we want, how we want, when we want. So listen, I'll take care of my own relationships. Thank you for saving me, Jesus, but I wanna be the king of my life. I'll go where I wanna go. I'll date who I wanna date. I'll marry who I wanna marry. I'll work where I wanna work. I'll go to school where I wanna go to school. I'll do whatever I want, and you never submit it to the king. We are guilty of this. So we, so we talked about, is he the king of your life? And then last week, we looked at frankincense. Frankincense was the oil. It was a, it was a beautiful oil that, that was burned as an incense in the temple. Now they use frankincense for all kinds of things, but it was that it, when you heard about frankincense and you're in the first century, you knew this is what they use in the temple. And we talked about this a little bit last week, just a really quick recap. The priest, the high priest, would walk into the Holy of Holies. If you remember, there was one, two curtains. He would go through one curtain, he would get ready, and behind the second curtain was the Ark of the Covenant. And this is where God temporarily said, I'm gonna dwell among my people. And so above the Ark of the Covenant would have been the presence of the Lord. And so once a year, the high priest would go into the temple after he sacrificed the goat and the bull, and he would sprinkle blood on the Ark of the Covenant. Now, it sounds kind of gross, but the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness of sin. And once a year, he would go in there to ask God to forgive the sin of Israel because God knew that no way could Israel get to him so God set up a temporary system, a sacrificial system that once a year, this would take place. And here's what happened. God would pick a mediator, and at this time was the high priest, to be the mediator between God and his people. And last week when they brought the gift of frankincense, we talked about how Jesus was the mediator. He became our high priest. He stood in the gap. God knew that you and I could not get to him so he sends his son to die for us who becomes the mediator between God and his people and now that we have been clothed with the high priest, with Jesus, we've been clothed with his righteousness, therefore we can enter into his presence. We can go behind curtain number two, which is not there because remember what happened when he was crucified, the curtain was torn from top to bottom and no longer was it rebuilt at that point from top to bottom, watch this, so that we could go in to his presence. This means this, you now have access to God 24-7. You don't have to go through priest, you don't have to go through Mary, you don't have to go to the Pope, you don't have to come to me. You have access direct to God because of Jesus. And he made that available to every single person. Now, did the wise men know that when they gave the gift of frankincense? I don't know. But we know the symbol of it, when you in, if you put it in context, was a priestly symbol as he becomes our high priest. And then today... We get to myrrh. Now, what is myrrh? We heard about this, right? We have gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, myrrh, depending on what translation you use, 
If you look at the New American Standard, which I believe in personal opinion, how it's structured, may be probably the most accurate English translation, a little bit harder to read because it's a word-for-word -word translation. If you count those, there's 16 times that the word myrrh is used in the Bible. 13's in the Old Testament, three is in the New Testament. I'm gonna show you those three just in a second in the New Testament. Myrrh was just a, this another, again, amazing resin. It came from this tree, and they would, it would come out liquid, liquid, but it would harden like a resin. And this became a great anointing oil. They would use it to anoint people. They would use it also for incense, incense but they also use it for perfume. If you remember the story of Esther, we're gonna be talking about, about that, that chapter or that, that book coming up in February. But if you remember the story of Esther, remember they, they would get themselves ready to present themselves to the king and for six months, every single day, they would put myrrh on their body as a perfume to intoxicate the king so the king would fall in love with them. And so they would put this myrrh on, so it was a perfume, it was a very expensive, expensive perfume. It was used for medical purposes. If you had a toothache back then, this is what they would use of myrrh. If you had gout, they would use it. If you have digestive problems, they would use it. It's crazy. But the, one of the biggest things it was used for internally was a painkiller to relieve you of some of the pain that you may face in your life or what's going on physically within you. You would take this myrrh. So there are also medical, there's people are still studying this stuff to see how, what it really could do in your life, but there are reasons for it. But the big one, the big one is that it was used for burial purposes. The Egyptians would use it to embalm people. The Israelites picked up on this and, and they would use it at the burial of their loved one. They would wrap them in linen with myrrh because myrrh was a perfume that would cover the stench of the decaying corpse. And back then, they would have a tomb that may have 30 to 40 bodies in that tomb. They would take the bodies into the tomb. So depending on when someone died, it would take about 12 months for the body to fully to decay. And then once the body would decay, they would gather the bones of the ones of your loved ones and then they would take them and they would bury them close to them. So the cave was a holding pattern for the body to decay. So all the time when people would bring someone into the cave, they'd, they'd try their best to wrap them in this myrrh, this spice, so it would protect the stench of it when they went in. Rabbis associated myrrh with a sacrificial death. Now, when we read this, it really doesn't mean anything. Okay, gold, cool, I like to have some. Frankincense, we have some. When my wife, she'll put it on. Oh, okay, we got that. But myrrh, why would I want myrrh? Like, what, what would that be important to us today? So the question I always wonder is, what did Mary and Joseph think? You're sitting here with baby Jesus. There's a knock on the door. And these guys come in, we don't know if there were three, there was only three gifts, there were probably a couple hundred of this moving in this group together. But three gifts, so they say three kings, three wise men, we don't know that number, we just know there were three types of gifts. And they present gold and all of a sudden you never, because you're a peasant, you've never seen stuff like this in your life, you've never seen this much gold in your life. They present gold to you and you're like, oh my goodness, gold, like this is great. So instantly your whole life would have been changed right there. And then they give frankincense. You know how expensive frankincense. So you think, if I don't use frankincense, I can at least sell the frankincense. But why would Jesus need the frankincense for? What's the whole purpose of the frankincense? And then myrrh. And this is the one you're like, have you ever given a gift before and you bombed? Come on, just sit there. Have you ever given a gift before and you bombed? Like, like this year, it's probably the biggest gift I gave that bomb. Lynn, you remember this, right? I gave a gift to her and, and, and it bombed on Mother's Day. It's a, I'm not gonna talk about the gift right now, but it bombed. I, I was in it to win it. This is it. This is awesome. This is great. And it was like, oh. Uh, okay. You remember this? You remember this? It was. It was like after 24 and a half years of marriage, I bombed this gift. Like I, I thought I was like this secret agent. I got it right. This is going to be it. She, you know, it's going to be, and she's going to love it, and she, she's going to want to make out with me that night, and everything it was going to be great. This was the gift, you know, like the, and it it really just tanked, right? I mean, it was bad. It's like, pfft, all right, all right. He said, and you probably have given the gift that bomb, but people they just didn't want to hurt your feelings and tell you. But when you're married to that person, they don't care. They'll tell you, and it bombed. This is probably when the gifts are like, why would you give me a gift 
that's associated with death. Because that's how they would have received it. They would have known that myrrh is what you put on dead people. Myrrh is what you wrap dead people with. Why would you bring gold as a king, frankincense that's a priest, but then myrrh, a gift for the dead that you wrap dead people with? And I know the famous song, right? We can sing the famous song and people ask the question, Mary, did you know? And I wanna submit to you more than she knew. She knew. Let's just go back real quick to the Christmas story. Remember when Gabriel when she appeared to Mary? What did he say? Look what he said. Luke 1, verse 30. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. Now, she's around 12, 13 years old when she was told this. And you will name him Jesus. He said, this is what you'll call him, Jesus. He will be, a very, he will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The moment the angel said that, she knew. She knew what was gonna be within her. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. She knew. She studied this as a little girl all through a Hebrew language, all through the Old Testament. She would have known this. She knew the prophet. She knew what's happening. She knew that someday a savior would come, a deliverer would come and sit on David's throne and would, and would take the people of God away from the Roman people because that's what they thought. It was more temporary there. They didn't see the big, big picture. She knew. Let's keep reading. He will reign over Israel forever for his kingdom will never end. She knew he would be a king because his kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen because I'm a virgin? And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and will the power of the Most High will overshadow you and you, watch this, so the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. Mary knew. And she goes on and says, just as you have said, so may it be. And then she has the baby, right? And she has the baby. They do exactly what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to dedicate it. If, if your first child is a, is a son, you take it by the law of Moses to the temple on the eighth day to be circumcised and to be dedicated to the Lord. That's just what you do. You know this. And she's fallen to the teeth of the book. She goes and she offers up an offering, which was like these two turtle doves and pigeons, which is an impoverished offering. When you don't have anything to give because you are so poor, you give turtle doves, you give peasants, you give these types of offerings to the Lord because the Lord knew you didn't have it. Therefore, if the wise men were there the night that he was born, she's no longer a peasant. She has gold and frankincense and myrrh. The offering would have been completely different. That's how we know the wise men have not arrived yet. But there was a guy at the temple named Simeon. And the Holy Spirit told Simeon the priest that he will not die until he sees the salvation of the Lord. The Holy Spirit pricked Simeon's heart to go to the temple that day. Just happens to be there when baby Jesus is showed up to be dedicated. And I want you to hear what he tells Mary. He says in Luke chapter two, verse 28, Simeon was there and he took the child in his arms and he was praising God and he said, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace. As you have promised, I have seen your salvation. Now imagine you walked in, someone grabs your baby, Mufasa in a moment like this, Mufasa, and they're holding the baby up and they look at it and says, I have seen the deliverance of Israel. And you're going, wait, what? My baby? Verse 31, which you have prepared for all people in he is the light to reveal God to the nations, his glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. And then Simeon blessed them. And he said to Mary, the baby's mother, this child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He will be sent and he has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and look what he says to Mary, and a sword will pierce your heart. Mary, he was born to die. 
And now she's putting together the picture of, okay, I've got gold, he's a king, they told me. I can see maybe she don't understand the frankincense that he becomes my mediator, my high priest. She should because it says he's gonna deliver his people. Mary is part of God's people. And then myrrh, now it's making sense. Could she imagine that her heart watching her son crucified on a cross was pierced? Mary, did you know she knew? She knew what was to come. And 700 years before Christ was ever born, the prophet Isaiah knew. And I wanna share with this, as we begin this to wrap this up, I wanna share with this what the prophet Isaiah said 700 years before Jesus was ever born. See, when we studied through the book of Revelation on Wednesday nights, you know what really strengthened most of, most of our faith? Is that faith, when we started seeing the prophecies that was predicted in the scriptures being fulfilled right before our eyes. And when you start seeing the scripture is true, archaeologists have found biblical sites over and over and over, and they have never found one thing yet that's ever debunked the scriptures. The scriptures already talked about, archaeologists finds it and confirms it. It's the prophecies in one person and one man to be fulfilled is un unimaginable. And I want you to hear 700 years, 700, think about it, 700 years before Jesus ever comes on the scene. I want you to hear what the prophet prophesied and said about Jesus. Isaiah 53, 6. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We've left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of all of us. Who is him? Who in the Old Testament would God lay on the sins of everyone? No one. He says all of us are like sheep. You know what? We've all gone astray. We all follow our own paths. We've all turned our back on God. So God laid on him the sins of us all. Keep reading, verse seven. He was oppressed, treated harshly, yet he never said a word. Do you remember when he's standing before Pilate? They tried to ask him and he just was silent. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter as a sheep is silent before the shears and he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants. Jesus wasn't married, he didn't have children. That his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. You remember, he went and borrowed a tomb from the rich man Joseph, our man. He said, here you can borrow this rich man until after the... Passover after the Sabbath so that we could go find a place for him. How did he know that? Verse 10, but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. Who's that? That's me, that's you. We will, he will enjoy a long life and Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands and when he sees all that he has accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. God will be satisfied with this last sacrifice, this last lamb that was slain. But because of his experience, my righteous servants will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. How did he know that? And we see in the New Testament three times myrrh. And you know what it was? When Jesus was born, they gave him the gift of myrrh as a symbol of death because he was born to die. He was the only person with the purpose destined to die for that reason. Jesus hanging on the cross. They think he's calling down Elijah so they wanna numb the pain and keep him going. So what they do, they take wine and they dipped it in hyssop, right? They took the sponge and what did the Bible say it was mixed with? Myrrh because myrrh is a painkiller and they didn't want him to suffer an agony so they dipped it in myrrh and they held it up to his lips for him to taste it and he rejected it 
because he didn't want anything to numb the pain to fully take on your sin and my sin. And he's brought down from the cross. And Joseph goes to him and said, hey, can we take down the body? You know, it's three o'clock, six o'clock is gonna be the Sabbath. We can't touch dead things on the Sabbath. Do you mind if we go ahead and bury him? And they said, sure. And guess who shows up? Nicodemus, the chief teacher of the law, who now becomes a believer of Jesus. And remember what the Bible says? That Nicodemus brought 75 pounds of myrrh and they wrapped Jesus' body in linen and myrrh. You see, he was born to die. So what's the point? The shadow of the cross has to fall on the crib. When you come and we celebrate Christmas, you have to understand Jesus didn't stay in the manger. He was born to die for you and for me. And the last three weeks, if I could summarize it like this, your king left his throne in heaven, who became your high priest, your mediator between God and man. And not only that, he became your sacrifice and died in your place because we should die for our sins. But God in his grace and his mercy sent his son that whosoever will believe in him will never perish but have eternal life. So remember the picture of the Old Testament in the temple. Watch this, not only is Jesus the king who enters in the presence of God, not only is he the high priest who enters in the presence of God, but it's with his blood that he has sprinkled on the altar for you and for me. And I know all the time, and I understand it, I've said it, you said it, we get cards, we post it online, we see the pictures, that Jesus is the reason for the season. But I'm here to tell you this, Jesus is not the reason for the season. You are. Because he would not have to come if we would not have sinned. And the reason why he's come is to save you. And we celebrate Jesus' birth, we celebrate his death, but we should rejoice that he came for you and that he came for me. That's why we celebrate what we celebrate. I love this, and we'll close with this last verse. First Peter says this. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors, which is a sinful life. Because we've all fallen short, we've all have sinned. And it was not paid with gold or silver, which loses its value. So how did God purchase me? How did he buy me? Look what it says. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Your King became your high priest he became your sacrifice so that we could come here today and worship him freely and have access to him now. Don't read over the Christmas story so familiar. Don't be so familiar with it that you miss the meaning behind why we do and why we celebrate what we celebrate. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads. The greatest gift you could ever receive is the gift of salvation. It's a free gift to you, but it costs God everything, His one and only Son. And if the Lord got you to one of our campuses today, or if you're watching this online, there's a reason for that. And I pray you just don't overlook that. And it may be because he is tugging at your heart, asking you to open up your heart and allow him to be the king of your life. He's already made a way, he's the mediator. He's already provided the sacrifice, you've been bought. You just have to receive it. The greatest gift you could ever receive is the free gift of salvation. 
How do I do that? Well, the Bible is very clear that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so my prayer is that you would repent of your sins right now and put your faith and trust in Jesus. You can cry out to him right now and say, Jesus, I believe. I believe you came for me. I believe you died for me. And I believe you got up out of the grave for me. And today I repent of my sin and I put my faith and trust in you. Who would neglect such a great salvation? The Bible is so true. It predicted what was to happen. It also has predicted what is to come. And I beg you to give your life to Jesus before it's too late. And if you do at any of our locations, your host or campus pastor, they're gonna come out, they're gonna share with you your next steps in just a few minutes. Father, thank you so much for your love and your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Father, that we can glean even just from the gifts that somehow you've moved in the Magi's mind to bring a gift of gold for our king, frankincense for our high priest, myrrh for our sacrifice. And my heart is that we just don't take that for granted. That we don't overlook the familiar parts of Christmas. That everything has a purpose, everything has a meaning. And I pray God next week that you would fill your house all over the world. That people of all nations, of all people group would gather at a place and worship you. That you would draw men and women to yourself this Christmas season. Because God, you're up to something. That's our hearts and that's our prayer. We love you, Jesus. In your name we ask and we pray. Amen.